Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I wanna thank you for being here with me today at PokerCoaching.com. And today, I want to show you how to best use PokerCoaching.com so that you spend your time wisely. I understand that we have a lot of content available on the site and with time, I do hope you get through all of it. But for now, I'm gonna show you how to get started and how to make sure you are utilizing the site well. So when you log in, this is the dashboard you'll see. It has some pretty basic information, like for example, the number of quizzes you have that are new. I have not taken all of my quizzes. I have 329 more to take. I'm busy making the quizzes. Um, next, we have how many new homework questions you have. Then we have how many days until the next poker coaching webinar. We have homework review webinars on poker coaching where I present you an in-depth question and you submit your answer. And then I go through all of the students' answer answers so that I make a point to figure out exactly where you may be going wrong so that I can help you improve your game. And then I also have the inner circle. The inner circle is an even more in-depth training where every two weeks, um, this, the members of the inner circle submit a in-depth question to me and I usually go through and make a PowerPoint presentation and answer it. Usually it takes about 30 minutes. And then the inner circle members get to call in and ask me their questions live. So it's sort of like office hours as if I am a professor. <laughs> so on the left-hand side here, you see we have the menu where we have all of our options. For now, let's just click on quizzes because the quizzes are a very, very beneficial part of pokercoaching.com. As you saw, I had 300 or so I had to go through. What I suggest you do when you get started at poker coaching is go all the way back to the very, very, very beginning. Quiz number one, start here. Because sometimes the quizzes are sequential. Like we see right here, we had a 1500 event, 1500 event, 1500 event. So all these hands are presumably from the same tournament. And you will very often figure out a uh, pattern among some of the players, which is very beneficial because quite often you're not playing just one hand of poker. Um, and also you know, sometimes the, whenever I first started the site, I was trying to explain things a little bit more basically. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure where you are in your poker career when you're watching this. But if you hop right into the most um, current quizzes, you may find that maybe a term doesn't make a lot of sense. And I want to make sure that you fully understand that. That said, the quizzes are not that sequential to where you really can't jump in wherever you want. Um, so let's take a look at a hand here. You see we have quizzes from Matt Affleck, a very good tournament player and cash game player. He has a lot of cash game quizzes available on poker coaching. And also Alex Fitzgerald, who is a very good online player, and he also has done pretty great live too. Um, I'm focusing mostly on live quizzes for my hands. So let's go ahead and get to it. As you see here, we have a description of the hand. Let's just take a look at number 350 here. And um, it shows how many chips we have, how many big, uh, what the blinds are. So here we're playing very, very deep stacked, right? And then we're going to get a score. And we'll talk about the score in just a second. But for now, let's click on quiz 350 and see what's in it. I actually don't know what's in it. <laughs> we'll see. Here we get king, queen, offsuit from early position, facing an under the gun raise from a loose aggressive kid. Should we fold, call, re-raise to 600, or re-raise to 900? And now this is where you have to tell me what you think the right play is. That is going to put you in my shoes and force you to make a decision. The problem really with a lot of poker training sites is that you don't have to do anything. You can just sit back and have a beer and watch a little bit of poker, but that's not how you actively learn and get better quickly. So this is as if you are playing these hands and you have me sitting behind you telling you what I think about your strategies. So in this scenario, what should we do? We have all sorts of options. Let's say we decide to re-raise to 900 this time. This is a spot where I think I have generally tightened up my strategies over the last year or so. Um, in the past, I would basically always play this hand, either calling or re-raising, often just calling. But thinking more about under the gun range and the fact that I have to fade everyone else at the table waking up with something, I think we just need to fold this and I don't even think it's close. Um, if we are going to play this hand, I think we need to three bet it as a bluff as opposed to call. I know this is probably a little bit different than some of my earlier quizzes here, but that's because we're changing it up. We're getting better. And what it really amounts to is these big offsuit hands just don't fare very well. So if we have a hand that does not fare very well, we either need to use it as a bluff with the blockers 
or you just need to get out of the way. One of the two, I think both players are fine. But I think I need to fold. I decided to call, though. I, I don't like this line. The times you can call here are when the initial raiser is loose and bad, and lots of the other players are very tight and passive or just loose and splashy and passive. Basically, you want to never get three bet, and you want the players to fold a lot of the time, which, you know, if you told me this exact situation would play out where I'm going to call and then small blind and big blind call and we're in position, this is great. This is almost as if we called on the button, right? If I was on the button, I'd be way more inclined to play the hand because then we still have to worry about the strong under the gun range, but we don't have to worry about all the players yet to act. In this scenario, we have to worry about everyone else. So anyway, flop comes eight, I'm a queen, eight, seven, two hearts. We have the queen of hearts. That's great. Opponents check to us. Should we bet? Actually, should we check? Should we bet 400? Should we bet 800? Or should we bet 1400? Okay, so as you see right there, we had some plays. I gave us eight out of 10 points, which is, you know, a, a good solid answer. I score all the all of the um, scores from zero or from one to 10. If you, if you guess a, an answer that gets one, you probably messed up pretty bad. If you guess an answer that gets seven or eight or nine or 10, you did great. So in this scenario, now the, um, we raise, or we called, we, yeah, we called preflop, small blind called, big blind called, flop comes, they all check to us. And now we have to, again, say what we would like to do in this scenario. Pots 1200, take a second, think about it, right? Don't just mash buttons, actually try to get the right answer. But if you don't get the right answer, realize it is okay because I go through and I explain the answers and say why you should do what you should do. Um, I don't think you should check in this scenario, but let's say I decided to check. Ooh. When they Zero. check to me on this board, we definitely want to bet. Given the board is incredibly draw heavy, we certainly want to bet on the bigger side. This is one of these classic situations where we want to bet very infrequently, but when we do bet, we want to bet on the big side, and we want to be betting with our best-made hands and our draws. So is this one of our best-made hands? It certainly is. It's not like the best-made hand, clearly, but it's pretty great. So we're going to bet, and we're going to bet about 800. I could also see 1400 being fine. You don't want to bet 400, though, because then you're giving everyone a great price to call with all sorts of stuff, and then you have no clue which outs you need to fade. So, okay, slow down here. We get raised to 2,000 by the loose aggressive kid in the big blind. And then we get cold called by the lag kid. What in the world is happening? Should we fold, call 1,200 more, re-raise to 6,400, or go all in? What a dicey spot I found myself in, huh? Um, at this point... If it was up to me, I think we should probably fold. But let's decide you want to find out where you stand and you make it 6,400. There is definitely only one right answer to this, in my opinion, and that is to fold. When you face a raise, a check raise, and a cold call from under the gun player who should have a very good range, you are going to be in bad shape here. Cold caller almost certainly has ace queen or better. And the loose aggressive check raiser almost certainly has a good made hand like maybe queen, jack, or better, or a draw that has plenty of equity. So against those two ranges, we are going to be in very bad shape. Loose aggressive kid's going to have me crushed. Well, two loose aggressive kids, I guess. The initial raiser is going to have me crushed. And this player is going to have a very nicely balanced slash polarized range, but it's going to be full of draws. So we need to fold. If we just face a 1200 check raise and this player folded, I would definitely call. But when it goes bet, raise, cold call, got to ditch it immediately. Alarm bell should be going off like mad in your head. Do not get involved. You're against two really strong ranges. Top pair does okay against one range, but it does quite poorly against two ranges. So let's see what these guys have. 3,700 on the turn call. Whoever's at three. Jam all in. Call. Well, clearly we have like sets or aces or something. Two good hands. We have a set and a set. Kind of funny. Loose aggressive kid, I think, played this hand really poorly. Um, if loose aggressive kid, take a look at this. If loose aggressive kid just bets the flop, I'm going to call. This guy folds. Now this player raises. Loose aggressive kid can then call because he's not so concerned with pricing people out because the pot's already going to be huge. But he gives me the opportunity to put money in the pot and then stick around. Or usually what's going to happen is it's going to go bet, call, fold, call, or something like that. Not from set of eights, but 
at least then he's getting money in the pot. It's so bad for him whenever it checks to me and then I check behind because now all the draws get to see the turn for free, like random gut shots. You really don't want random gut shots or random pocket nines to just peel that nine on the turn, right? And the next thing you know, you have a set, but it's just a straight up bluff catcher. Very, very bad slow play by the initial raiser. And I think the loose aggressive kid here probably should have check raised bigger. When he check raised so small in the flop, 1,200 more, he's essentially announcing I have no bluffs in my range or almost no bluffs in my range because I'm giving everyone else such a great price. That's something you should definitely look out for, especially in small stakes games, unless you think your opponent's check raising like top pair because they don't know what they're doing. But if they are check raising infrequently and they check min raise you or check small raise you, it's almost always a really, really, really good made hand. And clearly a set fits right in with that. So don't fall into a trap. Just get out of the way. As you see here, we flopped top pair, good kicker, and we lost, how much did we lose? We lost, I think, uh, 1,100 chips. It's definitely a good result. If you can lose 1,100 chips every time you get top pair against a set or two sets, you're loving life. So that is an example of one of the quizzes here on PokerCoaching.com. As you see, we had a score here, so we get to see where we messed up. You know, pre-flop, we played fine. Turn in the river as I would have made those plays. You know, perhaps we messed up a bit. Then we get a little bit of uh, bonus credits here. We'll discuss that at some point in the future. And then you can go back to the quizzes and take more quizzes. Take as many of them as you want. You can do it over and over and over again. Um, what I've actually heard a lot of people have done, a lot of our students here, is they will go through all of them and then they'll just go back to the beginning and start all over again. Because, I mean, let's get real. You're not going to remember 350 hands, right? So you essentially have infinite quizzes. Um, so next, let's click on the homework. This is the other main aspect of PokerCoaching.com. And we change the homework question every week. I'm sorry. We change the homework question every month. And here's it for this month. Everyone folds to you on the button with a 100 big blind effective stack early in a $500 tournament. The players and the blinds are both overly aggressive, almost maniacal. What is your strategy? So the first question is, what are you raising with? Now... It's very important to understand you're always approaching poker from the mindset of what is my range, not how do I play pocket aces, but what is my whole range and how do I play my whole range so that I can develop a fundamentally sound strategy so that I know where to adjust from once I know my opponents make a mistake. Now, similarly to the quizzes, I actually do suggest you go back to the very first homework webinars, which you can actually find here in the group webinar tab. I'll show you that real quick. What you can do when you first get started, is scroll all the way to the bottom, go to group webinar one, part one. You just click right here and it will take you right into the video. You can also download it if you feel inclined. You press play. All right, so. And what here's the webinar that I recorded. And interestingly enough, this was a very basic question. I tried to start easy, like I said. Everyone folds you on the button on the first hand of a tournament. The players and the blinds are middle-aged players who seem to be recreational. We have 7,500 chips. What is our raising range and why? So right off the bat, we're discussing what is a general strategy, right? We're not doing anything too fancy, but we do discuss how we're going to play. If we get three bet, we discuss how to play, um, you know, later in the hand, et cetera, et cetera. So you can go back and I suggest you just watch part one of the past homework webinars because in part one, I review the question and then give you my answer to the question. Let's just scroll up to another hypothetical and let's look at group webinar number nine, part one. I don't know what this one's about. So hello everyone. And in this webinar of the Tuesday, let's take a look. There's Mike Sexton for fun. <laughs> All right. As you see here, everyone folds to a reasonably loose aggressive player in the cutoff who raises a 2.5 big blinds out of a 50 big blind stack. You're in the small blind. The player in the big blind plays well. What is our strategy with each part of our range? So let's fast forward a bit. Maybe we can find, um, where I'm discussing my strategy. And here it is. This is the float the turn range analyzer, which we will use to be analyzing hands. And I say, which hands are three betting for value, which hands are three betting as a bluff, and which hands we are calling. They're all clearly color coded here. And then we're gonna be discussing slightly yeah, slightly wider. more and more. And I know all these situations have been pre-flop so far, but I promise a lot of them are post-flop as well. So let's go back to the homework tab and let's go ahead and we're not going to actually submit an answer because usually that takes quite a while. But let's just take a look at the homework form real quick. Here is where you will submit your answer. And as we see, some people are already submitting their answers for this. 
And let's just briefly take a look at this answer. This player, McLovin, says he is raising with this range on the button, all these hands in blue. And now, on the flop, let's say, suppose you raise to 2.5 big blinds and the big blind calls. Flop comes jack, seven, six, and your opponent checks. What is your strategy? Well, now at this point, someone's banging outside. I apologize for the noise. I'll try to edit it out to the best of my ability. Um, in this scenario, you have premium made hands, which are the hands in red. Actually, let's go through a different answer because I don't like the way he color coded it. I can always count on JJ Pregler to do it well. Um, JJ Pregler's raising these hands in red preflop, calling or at least continuing against the re-raise with the hands in red and folding the hands in blue. And this looks like a pretty nice strategy. Notice he is defending with 53% of his range, which is fine. I would actually tell him he probably wants to defend more against Maniacs. But um, that's a good answer. Looks like JJ Pregler has not answered this question either yet. So I apologize for that. Let's go back to this. Anyway, here, this player was suggesting betting all the hands in red and then checking all the hands in green, hands that have a decent amount of marginal showdown value, and then also checking some just garbage. And the way I would usually suggest people to break this down is to have your premium made hands in red and then your draws in blue because you want to make sure that you have roughly the correct proportion of premium made hands to draws in your betting range. Like as we see here, um, he also has the marginal made hands in green and the junky hands in gray. You usually want about a two to one ratio of hands in green to hands in gray. And these are just solid game theory principles. And you may say, well, my opponents aren't very good at poker. I don't need to know game theory. And certainly I'm not trying to tell you to be game theory optimal all the time, but you do need to have your ranges at least somewhat balanced so that you know where to adjust from. Remember, the goal is to take advantage of whatever your opponents do wrong. And if you don't know where to adjust from, well, you don't really know where we're adjusting to. It's important to know where you're starting so that you know where you are going, right? Like, for example, let's say we are against a Maniac. Well, now maybe we don't want to bet with so many draws because we don't want to bet with our draws and get raised against a Maniac, right? Maybe we can now bet with hands like a7, just straight up for value, because our opponent's going to raise us with all sorts of garbage. Um, let's say, alternatively, the opponent's a really, really tight player and literally never bluffs. Well, now we can just bet with everything, because if he sticks around or raises, we know we're in bad shape. So anyway, this is the range analyzer, and the range analyzer is actually very simple to use. Um, I'll just show you very quickly. There are actually instructions to use it right here at the top of the range analyzer page, and you can access the range analyzer easily in the homework form. So... What I do whenever I show up, let's say I'm going to do preflop, is I will do preflop polar. I, from the standard labels, it brings up this, which is nice and clean. Let's just say hypothetically I want to raise all these hands. You know, again, this is just completely arbitrary because we're talking about some random spot. And I'll show you how I would go through and color code the hands. Let's say the flop comes now. Jack of spades, seven of clubs, six of diamonds. I would now go to post flop aggressor, and then I would color code all the hands. So on jack seven five, let's say, what is junk? What is marginal? I typically start with the marginal hands because usually they're pretty obvious. So usually stuff like under pairs are marginal, stuff like one pair is marginal, right? And then we have um, junky hands that don't really connect much with this board at all. It's going to be hands not containing a jack, so I messed up there. Notice I just screwed that up. So what I have to do is I have to go back and put this in the premium made hands. And all these hands are rather junky, 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 junky. Typically, you're going to find that ace high is actually kind of marginal because you can check it back and then call any turn bet. Um, good. So notice now, if we look at our draws, we actually don't have any obvious draws here, right? The only obvious draw is 8-6 on jack-7-5 rainbow. So we actually need to find draws because typically on the flop, you're going to want to have a two, a, a, a ratio of two draws to every one value hand. So notice this is 26% of my range. I want this number to actually be, well, 70 or 50%, right? Two to one ratio. It's going to be kind of hard to find that. So what you can do is you can select, we have a board of spades, clubs, and diamonds. Let's do spades. 
diamonds and clubs. And now we can take all of these hands and use these as bets on the flop as a draw because they have backdoor draws with some equity. We could also, you know, given how we're still nowhere near the adequate proportions, we can take some of our jacks and check them. You may say, why would you want to check a jack? Well, if you bet a jack, a hand like jack 10 here and get raised, you're usually pretty unhappy, right? So you need to check sometimes. That's going to make your checking range stronger. And it's also just generally going to make you more difficult to play against. We also have these gut shot straights here, which are obvious draws. And, um, you know, maybe you want to bet a hand like queen 10, queen 9 as a draw, and king 9 and king 10. These are just um, straight up backdoor draws, right? Backdoor draws with overcards. Then that has us checking with some of these hands, checking some ace high. This ace 10 is actually kind of marginal value. What this really amounts to, though, is you see as I go through and play with a range analyzer, that we need to figure out what our range looks like so that we can adjust from here to take advantage of whatever our opponents do wrong. And right here, as you see, I'm having a bit of a struggle getting up to a two to one ratio of premium made hands to draws. Well, what that often means is that I have a range advantage. Typically when the board is somewhat dry and somewhat uncoordinated, the preflop raiser, the player who has all the best hands in their range has a range advantage. And then um, that player should be betting very frequently on very uncoordinated boards. If this board was instead something like 876, well, now I have to be much more cautious. But I discuss all this in the various homework webinars that we have. So once you have this image here, what you do is you scroll right down here and you click. Where is it? Well, first off, always save your save your hands to the, C, the CSV files. That way you can always come back and load them. And then you click create image for the form. That will create an image. If I click right here, it's creating the image. And then you just copy and paste this image and you can put it right into the form right down here at the bottom where you submit your homework answer. And that's it. That would be what you're doing on the flop. Now, this homework question, if we go back to it, actually said, what if we bet two and a half big blinds on the jack seven, six flop? I had the board slightly wrong. And the opponent now raises to eight big blinds. What is our strategy? Well, we would then have to make another image. The easy way to do this is if we go back, well, Notice we went back and we lost our lost our work because we did not save it. Um, anyway, if our work was still in here, what we would do is we would take out all the hands that checked on the flop because we did not um, we we did not bet those right. We bet the flop, therefore we don't have the hands that check, which means that we don't have those in our range anymore. And as you make any action, a bet or a check, that narrows your range one way or the other, and changes how you have to play on the later streets. And you'll actually find a lot of people play decently well pre-flopping on the flop, but on the turn in the river quite often they have big holes in their game because they have not thought ahead about how to structure their range well. If you ever find yourself in the, on the river, for example, in a spot and you say, well, I'm never bluffing here, what you're essentially saying is, I have not structured my range intelligently. Or if you ever say about your opponent, oh, this guy never bluffs, or this guy's always bluffing on the river. Well, that means you are essentially saying he has not structured his range well. So if that player has giant holes in their game, you can adjust to take advantage of it. But quite often, if you're playing against competent people, they don't have significant holes in their game. And, you know, whenever you're playing against good players as well, you want to make sure you don't have significant holes in your game because then you're going to be easy to take advantage of. So anyway, that is how you'd go about doing this homework question. And quite often, this does take the students an hour or two or three I know it takes me about an hour to make my answer, and I know what I'm doing pretty well. So this is hard work. You're not going to get good at anything in life without actually putting in some, act some actual legitimate hard work. I know, again, a lot of people like going to training sites and just watching a video and taking a nap, but that's not what we're doing here. We are actually studying, and that is why our students are seeing significant results, where they are winning major poker tournaments. So anyway, um, the group webinars, again, is how you access the past... Uh, the, the past homework answers. Again, definitely go back and watch the part one of all of those. And, you know, before you go back and watch the past homeworks, actually try to do the homework first. If you do the homework first, that way uh, you, can, you can look at your answer, compare it to mine to see if you're making any clear mistakes. 
And um, we have a lot of other stuff going on here. There are bonuses you can get. There are rewards you can get for taking the quizzes. Um, we have a calendar of all the upcoming events. We also have a poker forum where you can go there and discuss poker with the other students. But um, that is it. That's what's going on at Poker Coaching. I want to thank you for being here again. If you have any questions for me, always let me know. We have a great support team. You can email us at support at pokercoaching.com. I actually see every single email that comes through there because I want to make sure you're happy. This really is my life's work, helping you improve your life by improving your poker. And if I can help in any way, just let me know. I want to help. So thanks again. Good luck in your games. And I'll see you in the webinars.